The political fallout from the Lordstown plant closure and John Kasich is getting very serious. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Jackie Borcher, Columbus Bureau Chief for the Cincinnati Inquirer. Julie Carr Smythe, State House Correspondent for the Associated Press. Dale Butland, Democratic Strategist, and Mike Gonadakis, Republican Strategist. The Chevy plant in Lordstown symbolized Ohio's recovery from the Great Recession. GM invested in building a new car in Northeast Ohio. Three shifts worked around the clock to meet demand. Politicians, especially those who voted for the auto bailout, flocked to the plant for photo ops. Remember this ad? I'm Sherrod Brown, and this is a Chevy Cruze. We're both from Ohio. The engine blocks made in defiance. The aluminum wheels, Cleveland. The transmission from Toledo. And it's all assembled in Lordstown. I'm proud to have led the fight to pass the auto rescue package, helping to protect more than 800,000 Ohio jobs. I approve this message because no matter what you drive, that's something we can all be proud of. Sherrod Brown, he's fighting well, now for Ohio. Well, now it's all gone. This week, GM announced it will close the plant, laying off its remaining 1,500 workers. Now politicians are looking to cast blame. President Trump points to GM CEO Mary Barra, while his critics point to him. Well, we don't like it. Uh, I believe they'll be opening up something else. And uh, we were, I was very tough. I spoke with her when I heard they were closing. And I said, you know, this country's done a lot for General Motors. You better get back in there soon. That's Ohio. And you better get back in there soon. So we have a lot of pressure on them. You have senators, you have a lot of other people, a lot of pressure. That's the president's tax plan. It is now law. That's a big reason these companies are moving overseas. The president, first of all, needs to fix his tax bill instead of giving money to companies that move overseas. Dale Butlin, if Sherry Brown and John Kasich, for that matter, were to take credit for the Lordstown recovery, don't they deserve some of the blame if it's shutting down? Well, I think what they were taking credit for was was the uh, what was often called the bailout, which actually preserved the auto industry in this country. Um, that was a fact, and that happened. Now, what's happened since then is that in this particular case at Lordstown, GM, uh, people just aren't buying smaller cars like the Chevy Cruze anymore. GM doesn't have a line of crossover vehicles that are so popular now. The advent of ride-sharing apps has reduced the uh, purchase of cars. So there's lots of things going on. But remember, GM itself says that Trump's tariffs have added a billion dollars to its production costs, making a lot, a lot of these layoffs necessary. In my opinion, Trump sold people a bill of goods when he went to places like Youngstown, and he said specifically, don't move, don't sell your house, I'm going to bring all these auto jobs back. It was a pipe dream then, and I think uh, the question is now, how long is it going to be before these, these white working class voters realize they've been snookered? Is, it, is this a, a failure of politicians or just an indication, Julie, that they have very little control over market forces? Right. I mean, the, I do think that uh, this company, this industry, or have flexed an awful lot since, and, and evolved an awful lot, as Dale says, since that bailout of, was it 2009? Nine, 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 yeah. yeah. Not that and long ago, really, though. I mean, no, it, it is true. And I mean, at that time, those people seated in power were able to cut a deal with the existing CEO, and <laughs> may, and people were able to make promises to unions and and with un and agreements and. Things have changed. People have changed, and it does show that you can't always count on something to last through administrations and through decades and eras. GM announced in April that it was going to build its new SUV in Mexico. It's the Blazer. They're redoing it. Does Donald Trump had said these jobs are coming to Ohio? They're coming to the U.S. are not going to be in Mexico. Does he? How much blame does he get for this? Well, at, at the end of the day, whoever, regardless of who won the 26 presidential 2016 election, GM was going to close the plant in Lordstown because of economic forces. People weren't buying the cruise. The cruise was made in one place, Lordstown, Ohio. So to blame Sherrod Brown, Donald Trump, that's just political BS, Mike. At the end of the day, but he got up there and said these jobs are coming yeah. back. We're going to yeah. reopen these factories, and the ones that aren't very good, we're going to tear them down and build new ones. Look, some factories are open or have reopened. Some have closed. You got to you got to 
mixed bag of it. We're talking about Lordstown because it's our backyard. It's devastating. But at the end of the day, why don't we say, how can we fix this? How can we prevent this from happening again? We have an Art Model law in Ohio, which kept the crew from leaving uh, to going to Austin. Why don't we have some type of Art Model law as it relates to giving money to businesses here in Ohio? And then also, Mike, one question. Where was Jobs, Ohio? Well, Where were a, they? That's a question. Jackie, you, you wrote a piece in the Inquirer talking about all the incentives that the state threw at GM, and it didn't matter. And, and Jobs, Ohio was in the middle of that. Right. Uh, my colleague Jesse Belmer and I uh, had a story come out on Friday that kind of looked at that question and, and, you know, where was Kasich and Portman and Brown in this? And it's not that they didn't try. I mean, they tried, uh, you know, Jobs Ohio uh, offered uh, tax credits, uh, job training, um, offered, you know, resources to help uh, retool the plant to build another model. And that's really the focus now of of where all of these political leaders in Jobs Ohio are looking and trying to get GM to put a different uh, car in, into the plant uh, and then the, the option B or plan B uh, would be to get a completely different product uh, in that plant but it, it seems like you know GM was going to do what GM was going to do and even though you know there was really probably no incentive that the state could have offered to get them to to not decide to to move that product out the dirty little secret is that manufacturing jobs are not coming back big time we lost five million manufacturing jobs during the recession. Only 1.3 million of those have come back and only 400,000 of that 1.3 has come back during the time Trump has been president. The truth is America is transitioning from a manufacturing economy to a serv service economy and these manufacturing jobs are not coming back and politicians like Trump should not be getting up there and giving people false hope. And, and remember that Sherrod Brown and, and Donald Trump are on the same side on this tariff issue. Yep. And um, th the idea was, let's get people purchasing domestic steel rather than foreign steel. Clearly, in this case, it didn't work. Is, is this too, sh too soon? Because that's going to take a while for the steel factories to get up and going if these tariffs remain in place. And then it'll take a little while after that for auto companies to start building cars here to take advantage of the cheaper steel domestically is this are we being a little impatient here well i mean i think that is a good point that if you you know now if you get rid of the end of the line quite literally to the the whole production the point of the production which is producing the item you can sell then you don't have a market then for all that down um, downstream product and Ohio's huge in those areas as well. Now we do have other car manufacturers, um, mm -hmm. the Honda and others that you know are going to be able to use that use that material maybe, and the steel tariffs might still work yet. Getting back to the incentives, Mike, does this show that we shouldn't be offering these companies all these incentives? All these incentives that Jackie just mentioned didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. They got incentives before. GM got state and federal incentives to build the crews and employ workers here. In the end. The crews wasn't selling; they had to pull out. But they and they and they decided to build the truck down in Mexico. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm in the minority or majority, but I think if we're going to give incentives to any company, there has to be strings attached and more strings attached. If you're going to take your plant and go to another country or another state after getting state dollars, state incentives, we have a problem. Like our own, like the Art Model tax we have here uh, or law in Ohio. And if we do that, it's going to hold these companies more accountable at the end of the day to the citizens who gave them their money to begin with. Dale, Sherrod Brown has a plan where he. he we would get a $3,500 discount to buy cars um, by fully taxing automakers' profits that they make overseas. Is that the way to help auto workers here in Ohio is to offer a nice discount to folks buying a car, 3500 bucks, like a 10% discount on most cars probably. Well, I think that's one thing you can do. Uh, Sherrod has also been talking for a very long time about how we should not be giving tax breaks to companies to move their plants overseas, which we do at the moment. We should not be putting tariffs in place, which, as GM says, is adding a billion dollars to their production. Look, as I said before, a lot of these manufacturing jobs are not coming back. We're going to lose more as time goes on. But at the very least, what policymakers should not be doing is making things worse by, 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 by doing things like tariffs, which, which, which are only increasing the number of layoffs. But, I mean, the argument for tariffs is that they incentivize um, some of the behaviors we like to see in our production, such as environmental uh, responsibility and that kind of thing, and sometimes it costs more to produce something that um, you you believe has met different standards. And so that's always been, I believe, the Sherrod Brown argument on, on why we need to bring uh, products here where we can 
where we can monitor how they're made and get the jobs. Let's get to the next topic. John Kasich is inching forward in unveiling his plans for after he leaves the governor's office. Be out of office in, in a few weeks. And you, of course, you did run for president last time around. You ran for it back in, in 1999 as well. How seriously are you thinking about taking it on this time? Very seriously, I'm considering it, George. So, Julie, we've gone from I'm keeping my options open to I'm thinking about it. Now I'm, I'm very serious. <laughs> Realistically, when does he have to make up his mind that he's going to run? Well, um, I think his, the level of his seriousness depends on Donald Trump's headline of the day, you know. And, and this week was a really bad week for Donald Trump in terms of the Russia investigation. You know, if Donald Trump should uh, decide or implode somehow, you know, maybe he's, it's easier for him to make that decision. Um, if not, you know, I think waiting a long time would be fine. <laughs> he sounds, I mean, you can't wait forever. If you're going to run in the primary, the Iowa caucuses are a little more than a year away. You got to start making trips there and building an organization there. It sounds like he's, Jackie, more leaning towards that now. For a while there, he looked like an independent possibility. Now it looks more like a primary challenge. Yeah, you know, he's got a primary challenge, independent. Uh, his paths are pretty narrow. Uh, and so I don't know at this point, uh, yeah, you're like you said, he's got to get all of these operations together. Uh, and even if he goes in the primary route, I mean, as of today, you know, Donald Trump is running for reelection and has been since he, you know, the day after he was elected. Um, so, you know, what kind of operation is he going to need to, to compete with that? And so when he says very seriously, it, it, you know, I have to wonder, well, how seriously? Because the, the cards are stacked pretty high against him. More, more to the point, the GOP is Trump's party now. Every poll you see shows 80, 85 percent of Republicans supporting President Trump. So unless the Mueller report or a bad recession before 2020 uh, makes Republicans believe they can't win with Trump, it's likely to stay that way. So there's very little, mar there, there just aren't enough never Trumpers around anymore for Kasich to have a shot running in the party as long as Trump is popular. Mike, if you look at the recent history, well, Probably not really recent, but you know, you look at Ted Kennedy challenging Jimmy Carter in 1980. You look at Pat Buchanan challenging George H. W. Bush back in the in '92. That hurt their reelection chances, and they were, became one-term presidents. Is that a fear Republicans have that they, he'd rather not? They'd rather not have a primary opponent at all for Donald Trump. No, you know, the, uh, the Republican Party is different today, as, as Dale mentioned, you know, the party of Trump. We brought in a lot more people from Youngstown, Eastern Ohio, if we just look at Ohio for that matter, and uh, a lot of new faces in the Ohio Republican Party and National Republican Party. And at the end of the day, anyone can run for any office, but the bottom line is money. You're going to need hundreds of millions of dollars to challenge a sitting president in his own primary. My question is, Governor Kasich, where are you going to get hundreds of millions of dollars to challenge Donald Trump? It's not there. The emails are coming in, fundraising emails, right, Jackie? Jared Brown as well. We'll get to him in a moment. But um, does it come down to Bob Mueller's investigation? I think it comes down to his investigation. If there's a smoking gun there that makes Trump look really bad, the door opens pretty wide. Either Trump doesn't run again or the, the opportunities for challengers grow. Yeah, I think that's probably, you know, what he's hoping for. Uh, and that's why we've seen the, the campaign, Kasich's campaign has kind of stayed in place behind closed doors. And, you know, he is still traveling and as everyone in Ohio knows, yeah. he's traveling uh, and, and, you know, meeting with potential donors. And so that, you know, he's positioned to do that if that happens. And let's not um, kid ourselves. I mean, he's had a campaign operation in place since 1999. He never really pulled it apart. A lot of the people in his current administration were with him then. They'll be with him again. Um, and to Mike's point, I think it's true. But I also think, you know, his hope would be if you are, uh, the chosen person, the money flows. We we saw it last time. The minute the uh, Democratic primary, for example, was was decided, you know, Rich Cordray started getting all the money he needed to run a governor's race compared to when he when it was a question. Sure, Brown is also seriously considering it now. Dale, how serious a shot does he have? I may get into trouble with some of my friends in the party, but let me <laughs> let me say this. In my opinion, Sherrod is a great senator, especially for a state like ours. Um, I'm not sure how effective he would be as a presidential candidate. Uh, on the plus side, he's got a great message. This dignity of work idea is precisely what I think our party needs to start winning back some of those uh, working class voters. On the other hand, Sherrod is not a great debater. He's not a great 
speech maker and he doesn't naturally talk in the sound bites which unfortunately are so important these days when you're running for an office like the pres presidency so I could be wrong if he decides to run um, I'll do everything I can to help him but uh, there will be a big field of Democrats running in 2020 and I'll be surprised but happy if Sherrod is one of the finalists and just to add, I agree with everything Dale just said, but to add one additional one, Sherrod Brown's not liberal enough to win a re, uh, Democrat primary today. He's uh, pretty progressive. On a, uh, 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 not a chance when you're looking at some of the other names that are out there now, Booker, Harris, and others, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders again. I mean, to his credit, he's more moderate, and, and which plays well in Ohio, and he got reelected, but um, so he could never uh, cl uh, check all the boxes in a liberal. He checks Democrat a lot primary. of them. He checks gay marriage, uh, pro-choice. That's absurd. The front runner right now in the Democratic Party is Joe Biden, mm -hmm. who by any estimation is a centrist. We shall see. <laughs> we shall see how serious we get by next week. Anyway, Columbus City Council will consider a scaled down admission tax proposal. The revised plan would tack on a 5% tax on larger venue entertainment tickets. That's lower than the original 7% proposed tax. It would raise about $6 million for arts organizations, about half the original deal. Some of the money will go to fix up Nationwide Arena, but arena upkeep would only come from ticket taxes on Nationwide events. OSU games would not be taxed, but the university promises $1 million for the arts. We feel this is a fair plan, a bold plan, and a realistic plan that addresses the biggest concerns of our residents and stakeholders. The fee is lower than GCAC proposed, but thanks to our allies, we will have a huge impact for generations to come. Mike Gondakis, you're a leading opponent of this. You originally said that 7% was too much. It would cause people not to buy tickets. And you also said this amounted to a bailout for the arena by all taxpayers, or at least all entertainment taxpayers. They addressed both of those concerns, dropped it to five. Now the nationwide tickets pay for the arena. Is that good enough for you to support this now? Uh, certainly not. And as a matter of fact, the business community has now joined forces with our grassroots community. So we are going to be fully funded for the ballot initiative. So after months of, com of saying that this was a bad idea, a ticket tax, what did City Council respond? Not just one ordinance, but now two ordinances at 5%, one for Nationwide and one for the arts groups. Look, if you're going to a movie theater, you're going to go to a Christmas play, you're going to do all these things, you're going to pay an additional 5%. Does it apply to movie theaters? Yes, it does. It's 400 seats or more. No, right? for mo every movie theater, if the ticket's at least $10. You go to the movies on the weekend, Mike, it, the tickets are, are over $10 for it to go see a movie on the weekends. So it, it will apply. The movie theaters are part of our coalition. The motion picture industry is part of our coalition too. We are fully funded. We will start collecting signatures the second they pass it on December 10th. Look, at the end of the day, City Council refused to just sit down with the business community. They refused to sit down with taxpayers and talk to us and look for different alternatives. And what they're going to shove this down and they're going to vote for it come December 10th and we are prepared to go to ballot. This will never go into effect. We will beat this 70-30 at the ballot box. Mark my words. Dale, is this a good idea? Like a tax, a user fee. I mean, is this a is this a fair way to fund the arts organizations who say they need additional support from taxpayers? Unlike my friend Mike, I don't have any big dog in this hunt. I, I personally, I, I don't mind. I would don't mind paying a, a little bit more to support the arts in this city because I do think we need to do that. I think the compromise that's been put forward is better than the original. But here's what I keep coming back to: before council enacts any ticket tax for nationwide arena I'd like them to answer two questions number one why are the Blue Jackets which is a for-profit enterprise why are the Blue Jackets not paying any rent to use nationwide arena and second why is nationwide insurance company not paying any royalties for the naming rights to that place why are they getting it free if if the for-profit enterprises in this city were paying their fair share maybe regular people wouldn't have to pay it for them. You nailed it. Well, and I also think that, you know, for some odd reason, you know, there there's not the political will to to underwrite these organizations at some at some level like say the state budget or something like that. I mean, we have a lot of earmarks in there, but there isn't, you know, I mean, that would be an appropriate place to say, okay, we're all paying taxes, we all support the arts. The arts are good for the entire state and the whole community as opposed to, you know, well, one venue or one city is having trouble. Yeah, there, there, you know, there was something funny for the greater 
Ohio Arts, Greater right. Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council. Right. But it's still, it's, they claim it's not enough anyway. Uh, to Jack, uh, to, to Julie, just uh, one point of clarification. The Greater Columbus Arts Council already gets $7 million a year from the hotel bed tax, which is the highest in the Midwest in Columbus. So they're already funded at $7 million a year. And every time you see a crane go up and another hotel built, their revenue increases. So they already get $7 million a year. Dale nailed it. Thank you. Took my talking <laughs> points. Thank you, Dale, on Nationwide Arena. Jack, some other cities, I mean, Cleveland pays, I think they're paying nine, if I'm not mistaken, nine percent uh, ticket tax. Cincinnati's less, three percent. Columbus is right in the middle. Other cities are doing it. Voters there accept it. Why not here, I guess? Well, you know, to Julie's point about the state budget, I think there are some people who would rather see, you know, if, if taxpayers are going to bear this cost, it should go to, uh, you know, taxpayers who consume uh, a, a, a experience through buying a ticket who can maybe afford then to buy the ticket the, the so the tax is borne on you know a specific group of taxpayers but I, I agree with Dale that it's hard to support something that's going to you know bail out nationwide when there are other options that seem that other the other you know stadiums and uh, you know just I think it's just um, it's a couple million dollars alone just for the stadium naming rights and that's mm -hmm. something that you know every major stadium in every major city does and clearly there are other things that that those properties do in other parts of the country that we should be looking probably the, the thing reason why nationwide doesn't pay any naming rights is because they built the arena paid for it then when the city bought it took it over that they don't have enough money to pay back the loan to nationwide insurance it's very complicated it's been a long <laughs> history of the oh city not wanting the it's arena them wanting it then saying we'll pay for it but now you'll pay for it trying to explain it all is it's incredibly hard but we'll see how this the ticket tax is very simple yes or no we'll see how that goes the lame duck session of the legislature continues among the bills they are working on a pastor protection bill that would allow clergy to refuse to marry gay couples without penalty there's a bill to make strangulation a felony and still out there, the Stand Your Ground bill, and the gun bill, and the anti-abortion heartbeat bill. Jackie Borchard, what's the main priority for lawmakers this lame duck session? We have a GOP governor coming in. Yeah, so I mean, I think to, to get out of town before Christmas is a reasonable <laughs> goal. But, well, and for that, for that point, you know, um, not much is going to change uh, next year in the new legislative session in that uh, both the House and the Senate will be controlled by Republicans with super majorities, uh, veto proof super majorities. They don't even need any, you know, Democratic votes to, to pass things. You'll have a Republican governor who's, you know, very well known. He's not going to be a wild card uh, type governor. So there's certainly some things, some of the things that you mentioned, uh, you know, lame duck is always a mix of, you know, unfinished business, uh, some maybe more extreme or hot, hot button issues that people were you know reluctant to look at before the election, but now are eager to kind of get off their plate. And then uh, the wild cards, the stuff that you're not really expecting that just kind of gets tacked on to, to some bills and you figure out a couple months from now what they actually do. And some of the these are promises made to different legislators who maybe didn't win re-election or are term limited and they want to have that on their um, on their accomplishments list. Yeah. Uh, I, they're thumbing their nose at Kasich at every turn and that they possibly can. And uh, I'm not quite following, as you say, there's gonna be another Republican governor, one who said things like, I'll sign a heartbeat bill versus Kasich. So why they're going that route and, uh, and doing that to a same party president, are they trying to establish that the existing Republicans in Ohio are more conservative than John Kasich? for purposes of 2020, I don't know. But. Mike, on that heartbeat bill, you're ahead of Ohio Right to Life. You opposed the heartbeat bill before saying you feared it would not get held up by the, by the U.S. Supreme Court. With the changes in the court, does Ohio Right to Life now support the, the heartbeat bill? Uh, we've been neutral on it as an organization. Obviously, the court's much better today than it was a year ago, year and a half ago, and you know we'll see what the legislature does and if it survives a veto. You're neutral early on. I think you were more like, this isn't a good idea. Uh, no, we were opposed were, early on, but, yeah. and, but okay. over the past year and a half, we've become neutral on it. We have our own agenda, and we've got 90% of our stuff done. We have one more bill that will get to the governor's desk before the end of the year. I think the biggest issue to watch is if they change the constitutional requirements uh, to do a ballot initiative. That's the biggest issue. They want to go 60%, you know, a super majority, so to speak. And I think that's something we need to be hit the pause button on. So you're, you're okay with the heartbeat bill then? Uh, we're neutral. Neutral. Okay. May I weigh in on the sure, heartbeat yes, bill? Please. Yeah. So just a few months after a Mississippi law that would have banned abortion after 15 weeks was struck down as unconstitutional, the Ohio legislature is poised to pass a bill that would outlaw abortion after six weeks before most women even know they're pregnant. 
it's extremist. I've said this before on this show, that this bill, because it has no exceptions for rape or incest, would require a 12-year-old Ohio girl raped by her uncle to carry that fetus to term. That is not where most Ohio voters are. Yes, I know Republicans won the, kept control of the legislature. But there is no evidence that Ohio voters are for this. So I have an idea. Well, we Bef wait, wait, wait. we got to get there off the record. Okay, but before the legislature does this, how okay. about we put it on the ballot right. and let Ohio voters weigh in on this? All right, and the Supreme Court will decide it probably before that. Anyway, <laughs> off the record time, Mike on a doctor's trip first. Uh, yeah, I'm old enough to remember when Nancy Pelosi blamed George Bush for $4 gas prices. Well, I picked up my Columbus Dispatch this morning, and lo and behold, gas prices are under $2. So Nancy Pelosi can join oh. me in thanking President Trump for cheap gas prices in the <laughs> United States. Dale. The Mueller investigation is closing in on Donald Trump, and I predict that the Mueller report, which will come sooner rather than later, will show that the Trump organization was essentially a criminal enterprise that laundered money for the Russian mafia through its real estate companies. Julie. And uh, I was actually going to talk about Mueller, but if that is the case and something comes down, then I think we'll see John Kasich hop in and into the presidential race. And Jackie. And uh, on that note, the Enquirer will have a story early next week uh, handicapping John Kasich's uh, pass to the presidency. Wow. And with cars falling out of favor, and of course the Honda Accord manufactured right here in our backyard in Marysville, my guess is that Sherrod Brown, Rob Portman, Mike DeWine, perhaps even Donald Trump has Honda executives on speed dial in the hope of... <laughs> keeping that plant all open and running in uh, Marysville. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online, Twitter, Facebook. We shan't do Snapchat, but you can connect to all of that at our website at wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. And also check out our political podcast, Snollygoster, each week on WOSU. Look for it where you get your podcasts. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.